please be seated. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is uh, 137, Psalm 137, 1 through 6. Psalm 137, 1 through 6. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yeah, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Amen. Let's uh, open up first with a, a word of prayer and ask God's blessing upon his word here for us this morning. So Father, as we engage our minds into the scriptures, you've given us minds to be able to understand your word, you've given us language. And uh, with that, we ask that the ministry of the Holy Spirit would now render onto us the ability to discern, uh, to understand the, the scriptures, Make the uh, application that speaks to our heart. Allow you, Lord, to have your voice during this service this morning. You know our individual needs, and uh, might the word of God, even the words that, uh, that I would say, be those that you have chosen to, uh, to meet uh, the heart situation of your children here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The title is Singing in the Ways of the Lord because uh, the scripture that we're looking at this morning has uh, so much to do with singing. And so as uh, we enter into this, uh, just let you know right up front, a, a good part of it is going to be information uh, in the scriptures on the subject of music. And maybe a good way to uh, uh, explain this by way of an illustration if, if you've ever traveled a long distance, like 10 to 12 hours with children in a car, there was a game that we would every once in a while play. It was called Punch Bug. How many remember that game, Punch Bug? So what was it about? You saw a Volkswagen and you would punch your brother or your sister. Now, the downside of that game, it can turn into a fight, but with, that's when it gets out of control because everyone wants to see how hard they can punch. But the object of it, of the illustration is this. Suddenly, there are more Volkswagens on the road than you ever thought about. And you didn't know it until you looked for them and paid attention to it. And then, of course, you could enhance the game for uh, red Volkswagens or yellow Volkswagens, et cetera. You know, there was a time when they were kind of like not around, but they were a little bit more prevalent. It's kind of like walk, go driving up the highway now, and every kidnapping is a silver Corolla, I tell you. It must be the choice of kidnapped people. It's always silver. But Punchbug helped us suddenly, look at all the Volkswagens that are out here. When we go to the scripture and we talk about the subject of music, you're going to find that the Bible in this uh, text today, and we go to other sections, there is far more than the mind could ever imagine on the subject of music uh, explicitly by song or by instrument or what have you uh, on that subject. And we're going to be looking at some of those here today. But in our text, Psalm 137, I mean, let's just read it again for review up to verse 6. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. And there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they, waste, and they that wasted us required us of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So when we look at this, what's the main subject? There, there's the, uh, the use of the word, some key words show up. You have the, the words of music, 
You have uh, the key word also is Jerusalem, and it's considered the significance of all this by way of the introduction, but just to give you an overview. For example, verse 2, we find we have, they have an instrument of music. They hang their harps upon the tree, the willow trees. And then verse 3, we segue right into they that carried us away. They wanted us to sing a song. And those songs were to be the, the songs of Zion. And then in verse uh, 3 and 3b was the song and divine. And then in verse 5, we get to the skill ability of playing an instrument uh, that if my uh, hand, if I forget thee, uh, and let my right hand forget her cunning. Now, later on in First Chronicles chapter 25, when David is organizing his orchestra and his choir, uh, the, the use of men with cunning ability to play the instrument is used. So it's a reference to uh, playing music on an instrument. And in verse 6, the tongue is used for singing. So when they make this vow that if I forget uh, Zion, Lord, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth, it can no longer sing. So the major theme in this is all about that of music. That's why they are weeping. When we sat down by the rivers of, uh, of Babylon, we wept when they remembered Zion. And I would propose to you what they're thinking about about Zion was the subject of music and the songs that they would sing. And being in captivity, they no longer could enjoy all of that music and the participation in that music. So these were probably some of the musicians of uh, David's assigned choir that were part of the Levite temple uh, order, and these musicians are being asked to sing a song of mirth and a song of the Lord's songs of Zion to the Babylonians. So the subject is that of, of music. But in association to that, this is the connection. The key word also is that of Jerusalem, and substituted then at times with the word Zion. We wept when we remembered Zion. In verse 3, we have the song of Zion. In verse 4, you find an opposite. We are in a strange land. We are not in Jerusalem. In verse 5, we find that they are in Jerusalem. And also in verse 6, it is Jerusalem. So the association is uh, this. The significance between the two themes is you have the songs of Zion and you have the Lord's songs, which were dedicated to the city of Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the place of God. And so in their heart, they associated the sacred music of the Lord with a place. But music becomes the predominant theme of worship. That is what they remembered. That is why they are uh, in a, 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 a mode of, of struggle and, and the weeping because the music of God was so dear to them they couldn't let it go, but at the same time, they could not bring themselves to sing the Lord's words to the strange land, to the population that could care less of the message and just wanted to hear the, the rhyme and the rhythm. So just looking at that much, to give you three observations, it's still part of the introduction, that is this, that number one, music is the primary medium of worship. In the scriptures, you'll find, as we'll look at this as we go along, but music is the primary medium of worship, so much so that I actually had to really scale back what I would present to you this morning. Otherwise, it would just get too boring and too detailed. But just for a matter of highlight, music was used for teaching ministry in Israel. It would be used as Isaiah would use it for prophecy by way of songs. And then there would be music by, in the celebration of the different feasts. All of this was part of, of the worship. And then our second thought is that, that the thoughts of Zion were actually the memories of God's songs. When they would think about Zion, they weren't necessarily thinking about the temple and its beauty and, and uh, uh, the uh, activity went, that went there, but they specifically because of the numerous mention, in fact, every verse mentions music, and the weeping is because we cannot sing in that place. If we think about Zion, we and Jerusalem, we think about uh, the memories of God's songs. Now, 
you don't have to be a scholar, but when you read the book of Psalms and you read some of the, the, of the lyrics of David that David and Asaph wrote, uh, you'll find that it falls into two very simple divisions. The first division is that of God's history, his history, the way his acts of dealing with Israel and the other nations, times of deliverance, times of uh, giving to them wisdom, uh, songs of salvation. There would be songs of hope, songs that promoted leadership. And, and so the, the music of Zion uh, in one category was the music of history. In other words, it would revisit the things that God did with his people all throughout their previous history from the time of Genesis and forward, the crossing of the Red Sea, the crossing of the Jordan River, uh, the bringing down of strongholds and cities, King Solomon and his temple and the dedication. And so those would be the highlights that would be there. The second category of, is that of who God is. The first one is how God acts with his people, and second category is who God is. He is a God that is yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he's the same in every time frame. That is, he's faithful in all occasions, he is sovereign, and he is righteous. And the music, the lyrics, the words, the tunes, the songs would bring all of this up front. So when the people were engaged in the choir and singing with the Levites, uh, at the different festivities, they were always, always singing about God, and history, his marvelous acts, his awesome deeds, and they were also talking about the God that is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and speaking of his faithfulness. And so that was, uh, that, that was their genre, that, the, that, uh, the lyrics of their music consisted of these themes. And third, when you wrap all of that up, so we would say this, therefore, music to the Jews, and it should be for his believers, was sacred by the very nature of the song itself. So music was sacred by the very nature and the words that were in the songs, the music that would, they would sing. And sometimes, here we find, in our text, we would take this in consideration, the sacredness of their music. It would bring about sorrow in its absence. We can't sing these sacred songs of God's historical acts and his awesome deeds and his uh, continual sovereignty. It would bring also hope. When they would think about that, you'll notice in verse 2, we hung our harps on the willows in the midst thereof, meaning we're going to still sing later on. There's going to be a time. Remember, they, uh, by some point in time, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah had told them that 70 years of captivity, Daniel going to uh, reinforce that, that there's this 70 year period of time is going to come to an end. And so our sermon tonight is going to be on verse two. We hung our harps and the implications behind that. So the, uh, the singing, the music, would bring sorrow because they couldn't sing. It would bring hope because they knew that there would be restoration. It would bring conviction. We are not going to sing in a strange land. Now, whether the Babylonians were just teasing them and taunting and saying, hey, give us some of your music, you guys, or it could be they were interested in what they had to play and what their words were because the Babylonians were also musicians and known for that. But their conviction was, as Jews, this singing is not appropriate. First off, our hearts are sorrowful. We are absent. We are not in Jerusalem. We can't sing. We're not in the right place. And at the same time, um, we're not in the right frame of mind. It's just not, we, 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 they could not generate the joy and the marvel that would be during a typical celebration in Jerusalem. So you have sorrow by absence, hope by hanging on to the instruments. There was conviction. They believed what they were singing. And then about, we could say also that they brought commitment. The idea of music and its sacredness proposed a commitment by the form of a vow. If I forget Zion, allow my hand to forget 
how to play the lyre or the ten, instrument of ten strings or the harp or the tubal or the trumpet. Let my hand lose its skill. If I forget Jerusalem, allow my tongue not to be able to pronounce words. Let it stick to the roof of my mouth. So in other words, they were so committed to music and its purpose and its sacredness because it magnified God, exalted him, it taught their hearts, he became large in their eyes, that it brought about a commitment to maintain its integrity. And they weren't going to defile it by singing it in a strange land. And the enhancement of that, the seriousness of it, was by this vow of the removal of skill and the removal of voice. What was all of that about? Once again, we're back to music, either by voice or by instrument. And so the two major thoughts for today is when we consider all this is very simple. Number one is music in the Bible. That's going to eat up a lot of the time, but I think you'll uh, find it very informative. And the second is going to be music in the heart of the believer. In other words, as believers, how do we treat music as individuals in the church and when we're not in church? So those will be the two, music in the Bible, music in our hearts. Let's look at the, uh, the Bible theme first when we talk about this. Uh, we, there's, there, were, there, were so, there was so much there, but let me give you some of the highlights. Uh, when, they, when we talk about singing the Lord's songs, we might just break it down into some very obvious categories. None of them deserve much of elaboration. They speak for themselves. So you would have songs of deliverance. There would be songs of victory. Of course, there are songs of hope. Uh, many were written by David and his chief musician, Asaph. Songs of celebration, uh, picking up where Miriam left off at the Red Sea, and, and then lyrics and words that would be written to be repeated later on. There would be songs of worship. And uh, we, we have to remember uh, that sometimes the songs would not have instruments. They would just be, uh, they would be singing uh, with, their, with their own tunes that they would create. And by the way, there were tunes in the Bible. So let me give you four categories. The occasions for music, the instruments, then what about the songs that they would sing, and what about the tunes that would be there? And believe it or not, hopefully you believe it, it's all found in the Bible. It was a practice that in this in the subject of music, uh, there is a, uh, there were the occasions, there were the instruments. The Bible speaks of the different songs, and then there were different tunes. So I'm going to go through this, uh, trying to maintain a pace. But uh, on different occasions, the Jews had their weekly Sabbath. Then each month there would be the the celebration of the new moon. There would be the yearly uh, Passover pilgrimage feast, Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Booths. There would be the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of Lights. And each one of these, uh, and then there was the uh, year of Jubilee, whereby every 50 years, ownership of land was restored. And so each one of these celebrations was a holiday. And it was more than just eating. They ate more than Baptist. They, they celebrated with, uh, the, with lamb and meat and fruits and vegetables. They had a big spread. These were serious. And they had much music. And so the occasions. Now, um, I, I could give you verses, but I'm not because I want to keep moving. I'm just giving you information. This is all in there, and you'll stumble on it in your reading, especially in the Old Testament. But some of the instruments, our second category would be the instruments that were used. And once again, uh, scripture reference, when you look at up some of the words that I will give you, you'll find it. But it started in Genesis, actually started in Genesis uh, chapter 4, pre-flood. And uh, we have the, uh, uh, the man by the name of Tubal, who was skilled in the making of instruments and uh, wind instruments primarily, the pipe and the uh, different other of the wind category. But in the instruments of self, there were three categories, three groups. There would be the wind instruments, 
then the flute, the, ha uh, the, uh, the trumpet, the cornet, uh, there would be something that was like a saxophone. Uh, there would be the string instruments, much the lyre, the harp, uh, the violin, uh, the percussion, which was primarily cymbals that were used. And so these three major instrument groups would be used during these different celebrations or these songs that uh, the Jews would sing. Some of the wind instruments, if you want to research it, capture the word here. The, and these are King James words. You get into New King James or the NIV or the ASV, they'll assign a very similar, probably a more common uh, instrument's name. But the King James used these words, the, the cornet, um, the dulcimer, uh, a flute, and then there was the horn and the trumpet. They were the primary wind instruments that would, and you'll see substitute words such as the pipe or the flute. Uh, the organ is used. Notice, remember when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he speaks to them of how uh, they were not paying attention to his words, but he said, yet the children will follow the, the flute and play games by playing a flute, which has introduced us to the idea of the use of that wind instrument even on, at, on the street. Not only do you have the, uh, those wind instruments, but uh, you have the stringed instruments, the harp, the lyre, uh, the psaltery, the, the viol. Uh, these were stringed instruments. David was known for what? His ability to play the harp. He, and it was a soothing form of music that would uh, banish some of the evil spirit, the evil mood that would be found in, uh, in Saul. Percussion instruments, we read much about that. Old Testament, crossing of the uh, Red Sea, Miriam strikes up the band with the, with the cymbals and the other instruments that they had. So you had bells, you had cymbals, you had the tabarets. Uh, we have uh, jingly things in uh, music today. They actually had a device where the metal parts inside of the wood were loose and that the shaking that to a particular rhythm and uh, a beat was there to maintain and enhance the music that would, they were singing, the words that we were singing. So you had those different occasions, we had these different instruments, but what about the songs themselves? Does the Bible record anything to us on songs? I'd like for you now to turn to uh, Isaiah chapter five for beginners. In Isaiah chapter five, uh, we would find out that if you read different sections in Isaiah, the key word is going to be singing and song and instruments. Isaiah wrote 11 songs, in 11 messages that were in the form of music in the book of Isaiah. Not only was Isaiah good at poetry, but he was skilled in music. And so just as an example, Isaiah chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, Notice what he says right out of the gate. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And for the next, the verses that follow up through verse 6 and 7, this is what uh, the theologians said in the Hebrew, it would be called the song of the vineyard. Chapter 12, verses 1 to 6 is the song of thanksgiving. And, it's a, and, it, and it's, a, it's music and lyrics written by Isaiah that uh, speaks of their deliverance and their rescue. Chapter 26 is another one I would like for you to turn to in the book of Isaiah, keep paging to the right. And in chapter 26, in that pretty much all of that chapter, it speaks of the return of Judah coming back to their homeland Again, prophetically, Isaiah is uh, rendering prophecy in the form of music. Remember, it served for teaching purposes, it served for prophetic purposes, and it would also be for historical reminders of God. Isaiah emphasized both the uh, 
reminder of God's power, prophetically what God is going to do, and that's what we have here. In that day, when Israel is returned, and Judah is returned, shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city, and so the words begin. Isn't that something? You read this, but unless you put it into the context of music, just over a simple little word, song, you suddenly realize uh, the place, the value, the importance of music in the Jewish life. Now, just go, haven't gone so far, now do you understand when they're at the rivers or the canals of Babylon, they hang their harps up on the willow because they cannot play them? They're weeping because of these different occasions are missing. The different instruments are no longer coming as sounds to their ears, maybe by the local bar of Babylon, but not God's music and God's song, the Lord's song. The songs of Isaiah are absent. Um, Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 to 10, speaks of the song of the redeemed. Similar to that, we find in Revelation, where John talks about the angelic host, the redeemed are singing the new song to the Lamb of God that sitteth upon the throne. To him be glory and honor and praise forever and ever. Which moves us into the New Testament uh, by way of songs that were sung. Remember Mary's Magnificent, and which was put to the, the form of, a, it was poetry that would be put into the form of music. So when we read it, they understand that she's literally singing this song with her voice. Paul, in chapter 5 of Ephesians, encourages us as believers that uh, we singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse uh, 16, uh, singing, making melody in our heart, and also singing songs and hymns one to another. John's in the book of Revelation, in chapter 5, beginning of verse 9, is the new song that is going to be sung. The song of the Lamb, the hymn of victory. These are uh, songs that are in Revelation, the heavenly setting and the heavenly scene. Music, music, music. Variety of instruments, some of which we are very familiar with today. A large number of instruments that were uh, being played and being utilized. To give you some idea of the number of instruments and the size of the choir, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 23. In 1 Chronicles chapter 23, I'd like for you to observe uh, David's formation of, the, of his choir and uh, just how how outstanding this was. Now, these are the last days of David, and so the, uh, the writer is just kind of re refreshing everybody's mind. These are some of the David's final acts. And so, uh, verse 1, when David was old and full of days, he made Solomon his son king over Israel. And in verse 5, we get down to the Levites and what they're doing. Moreover, 4,000 were porters, 4,000 praised the Lord with instruments which I made, made, said David, to praise therewith. And he divided them into courses among the sons, namely Gershon, Gath, and Merari. So here, how, you know, we thought the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Tire was big. 4,000 singers, the instruments accompanying it. Much of these guys were employed when Solomon dedicated the temple. The, uh, the numbers and the instruments that we find here. Remember, uh, David dies, the musician, the choir is in place, the choir director is in place, the instruments all are all ready. Solomon dedicates the temple and the choir and, and the, uh, uh, the instruments, what is that called? Uh, the, peop the people that play the instruments. The orchestra, thank you. And the orchestra is ready. It was just that one word. I'm just trying to give something different. So we have a full-blown orchestra, and all of this comes to the surface. Chapter 25 gives us a little bit more insight on this. And beginning at, uh, we could start at verse 1, but I'm going to start at verse 5. And these are the sons of Heman, the king's seer, 
uh, the words of God to lift up the horn. And God gave to Haman 14 sons and daughters. These were under the hand of their father for song in the house of the Lord, cymbals, psaltery, harps, for the service of the house of God, according to the king's order, Asaph. So the number of them with their brethren were that, uh, that were instructed in songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning, skillful, were 248. 248 individuals that were just in the instrument side alone. And some of the different instruments are, are mentioned in the previous verses. Verse 3, for example, um, the hands of their father, Judathun, who prophesied with a harp and to give thanks unto the Lord. And then in verse 1, it talks about the psalters and the harps and the cymbals, and each one was given a job. So that the beginning of that chapter, of chapter 25, is all about instruments and singing. Isn't that something that uh, the, uh, the, that much music is like Volkswagen's all of a sudden appear out of nowhere? And now all of a sudden we realize music was uh, such a major player, a major part in the worship. So that's music in the Bible. We, we still have a category left, and that would be tunes. You have uh, the occasions, you have the instruments, you have the songs, but what about a tune? We obviously, you know, we, we whistle a tune in our heart. We may not know the words of some of the hymns by memory, but we know the, enough of it by the tune of it to be able to sing it at different parts during the day. Well, when we talk about some of the tunes, interestingly enough, there are eight tunes with words f set to music. Now, how do you get that? Because in the book of Psalms, if you go to Psalm 22, just to start out, and we go to Psalm 22, you will find that on, in your Bible, especially if you have uh, a Bible that has the headings right beneath a song number. So in Psalm 22, notice the wording that is there. Now, this is where if you have uh, a... Bible concordance that will translate, for example, Olive Tree has a word study Bible, digital format. If you put the cursor on a word, which we would do here, to the chief musician upon Er Shaleth Shahar, you put the cursor on that, it will tell you that it is either a tune or an instrument. Most of the scholars would say this is a tune. And the, the tune would be to the title, The Deer of the Dawn. So what we read is actually, even though it's telling us about Jesus Christ, that psalm was written with lyric and rhythm and movement. There was a tune that was, a, that was uh, attached to it. We would go to uh, even more so uh, Psalm 57. Go fast forward to Psalm 57 and back it up to 53. And again, we're going to use our computer. We're going to put our cursor on Psalm 53, the heading that is underneath it, which is all part of the Hebrew. Uh, the translators didn't just add this. This is part of the Hebrew script. So the chief position upon, what, what is that? Mahalath, uh, Maskil, two separate words. Um, and it's upon something. Now, in your concordance in the center column of your Bibles, you may have a word there. Uh, it uh, would speak of a choir, like in my Schofield, it's the letter H, and the word translated there is apparently a, uh, a temple choir, but it also could be an instrument. But you get the point. It's, it's lyrics. It's a tune. And so what is written in Psalm 53, the words were then applied to a musical tune that would be singing. Now, obviously, I think we know, uh, especially in the elementary department, how do we, how, what is the best way to teach Bible lessons is by the, the um, uh, vehicle of music. I'm in the Lord's army. Um, J the story of, of Joshua, the story of Gideon. And David and Goliath with the stone, or there are all this little light of mine holding up your candle. 
all about uh, the Christian life in the form of music. They were teaching means uh, and methods. And so the psalmist would uh, assign the words and it would be given set to a tune. And you know that not so much by the English word that is here, but you would have to go to Hebrew. So let me exhaust your imagination a little bit more. If you go to Psalm 57, up through Psalm 59, this series of psalms also are a series of tunes that uh, were written during that for the purpose of educating. To the chief musician in Psalm 57, I'll test this, I, I, I'm going to stumble over it, so I'll let you read it yourself. And a mitzkum of David where he fled from Saul from a cave. Now, again, it's a story, but it's a story in a form of a tune that was set. Likewise, you see that in 58, chief musician. So here gives you already a heads up that the Asaph, the chief musician, is going to put this to the form of music. Psalm 59, the instrument and the tune language is used once again. And verse also in Psalm 60 and in Psalm 75. Remarkable. So when they, the services, and, and then when they would be reading from the Psalter, there would be times where it would just be reading words, but then there would be times when they actually would begin singing. And so sometimes when you're watching a, a movie about Judaism and they get it right, you'll find the, them singing uh, psalms. And therefore, when Paul writes, singing uh, psalms and spiritual hymns in your heart, because Paul was Old Testament childhood as a Pharisee, he knew that the value of these tunes and these lyrics, the value that it would be in, the, in their heart. So that puts us the end of music in the Bible. It's well worth exploring. There's so much more to look at. But let's talk about now music uh, in the heart of the believer. How do we make the application? We don't want to depart from uh, the Psalm 137. And mainly the major idea is the fact that music was such a critical role that they were either encouraged or they were saddened. And it centered around whether we could hear the music and play the music or not at all. And they would never give up hope. So that very, uh, very essential use of music with lyrics and words and tunes and instruments for the believer's life, we would look at it this way. Singing uh, is a way that we exhort one another. Singing sacred songs is exhortation. It's a necessary exhortation. That's why Paul tells us in, the, in Ephesians chapter 5 uh, of singing. and Colossians 3.16, he talks about singing. We are exhorting one another. So when, you're, when we're together, and by the way, I'm going I'm to say something now. I'm going to get a little bit more firm on the subject and congregational participation. I got a bird's eye view of everybody. I can't read lips, but I can tell you if lips are moving or not. And I understand that we can be singing in our heart. But uh, can you imagine 248 musicians of David's choir Singing just from their heart? What did you say? I don't hear anything. It would be a mute choir. They might have wonderful words, the tunes, but if no one's singing, there's no participation. There's no encouragement to the listeners. Let me encourage you that if you want to have the, the idea of music and the reminder of the history of God working in mankind, the encouraging words that are found in hymnology today, if you want the full benefit of that, you have to sing. There is no way out of it. You must sing. And the better part of it is, even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, just sing. The Bible talks about making a joyful noise. It doesn't mean that it's disorganized, but it does, in a way, say, here are the parameters. There are none. Just sing to the Lord. Why? 
It is so self-encouraging. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul speaks about singing and on the subject of gifts and spiritual gifts, etc. But in verse 15, he says this, What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding. Now, does that teach us something right up there? You don't have to go too far. I know what I'm singing, and I'm singing in the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is involved in our music time. There, someone once, I don't know if they meant it sarcastically or in a derogatory sense, once said, okay, so nowadays we have what is called the worship leader, and then someone comes along and says, well, if he's the worship leader, then what's the pastor? Because presumably the pastor's role in preaching is the, is the essence of worship. But if we take and look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, worship and the Word of God were a whole. It was you know, two sides of the same coin. Because the, uh, the Jews of Babylon weren't sad because they couldn't hear a Pharisee speak or a priest. They were sad because they could not enjoy the fullness of worship by use of hymns and music, history, deliverance, the activity of God. That's why they were saddened. And so Paul encourages us as believers when we sing, Sing as unto the Lord, but sing with understanding. Know what you're singing. That means we meditate, we reflect upon the words of the hymns that we sing. And maybe we'll do some of that here tonight. Uh, it's, uh, it's one thing to be able to just say the words, but it's another when we know that we, we, t we stop and we, we measure. Let me give you a suggestion that's a good devotional time. You know, sometimes the Word of God, and I'll, I'll admit there are times when you're reading it, it's like, I just can't pull down anything out of this. But we don't want to walk away without a blessing. Let me give you a good secondary, and that is pull out your hymnal. Somebody did your homework for you. In your hymnal, when you read uh, some of the sacred songs that are there, I don't care what it is, most 99% of the time you're going to be reading theology. And you can take those words and you can choose your hymn. I'm, I'm really discouraged today, so find a hymn of praise. I'm really thankful of, of my salvation. Find one and you go to the directory in the back, the subject matter, salvation, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Uh, I love to tell the story and so many different hymns. You see, in other words, that can be just reading it, reflecting upon those words, because they are so biblically and scripturally based, they will serve as a good, very good uh, substitute, momentary substitute to lift our heart and our spirit. Why? Because we can sing with understanding. So we sing to, with, to ourselves, singing with understanding. We sing to others. And James tells us in James chapter 5, if any of you are happy or glad, let him sing songs of joy. So on a good day, sing your songs. And Paul and Silas, for example, they were singing songs while they were in prison because coming out of Old Testament, they, the uh, volume and... Uh, the consistency of music in the temple for different celebrations, they probably had most all of them practically memorized. Let me give you a couple of thoughts to take away very briefly. Number one, we just said, sing with understanding. When you're in church, especially when you're in church, participate. And that is critical for yourself and for the individual behind you. We are not here to judge each other's ability with notes and uh, tune and, and how what key you're on, just sing in any key, but the key is singing. Secondly, sing with a focus. Pay attention to the words that we're singing in our hymnals. These are not accidental. And um, the, the, by the way, the music that we have in our hymnals now is, is not the final, uh, like King James authority on music. 
New music is being written for us all the time. Some of it is very biblical and very scriptural. Some of it is not. I'm not here to uh, make the judgment call. You do that. But just listen to the l- lyrics, look at the wording, and, uh, and take it from there. How much biblical is, there, is it biblically based? And then uh, sing with an attitude. In other words, sing with the attitude of joy, the attitude of, of thankfulness. Sing with an attitude that I want to worship you, O Lord. I want to lift up my voice and sing unto the Lord. You see, when we do that, and we find ourselves, and by the way, there could be the day in our generation whereby we may not be able to be in this building and sing these songs. It's not that far off, but we'll not be discouraged with those thoughts. But I will tell you this, the preparation of the heart for those times when we're absent from here and absent from one another is going to be when we have a repertoire of, of, of songs that are kind of like there, And they just freely flow. And the best way to do that is the practice. Practice while you're in church. And good music on a radio station, practice then. So, Father, we thank you for musicians. We thank you for the Bible's musicians and all the the hymns that are there in the form of psalms. Different tunes and then the words, the instruments of praise, celebration, Why? Because you're a magnificent God. So we ask you that you would uh, allow a melody to just arise within our hearts, even as we sing here for our uh, closing hymn today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.